receive this morning, your words that you have prepared and you have planned for us. And we call our pastor blessed in Jesus' name. The church said. God is good, amen. If you're wondering what happened to that beautiful lady that normally gives those announcements, I got her tied up at the house. No, I'm just kidding. Um, she had an opportunity to go spend some time with some of her friends, and so she went away for the weekend, and we all need to get away some time and rest, amen? But it's good to come back and be refreshed and good to be in the presence of the Lord, amen? James, you and your beautiful wife, just stand up for a quick second. We got to do that. I want you to see this couple right here, and this is a couple that that been knowing James for some time now, and they have a ministry, Broken Vessels, Forgotten Vessels. Uh, we've been invested in their ministry for a while, but, but now they're coming under our ministry. And this couple right here is uh, um, doing some great things with, with some of the transit uh, people that are houseless. And, and they they're got a place... And we're fixing to move into another place. We're fixing to do some really great things with them. But I want you to see who they are because it takes a special person to do what they do. Uh, a lot of, several guys in this room, I won't call them out. Don't embarrass them. But some of the people in this room are in this place. Uh, but people that are coming out of prison need a place to stay. People that are homeless need a place to stay. And, and there's so many things about this ministry. I'm not even doing it justice. But I, I want you to know that we're fixing to do a whole lot more in this ministry, because we really want to be involved in it. We, we believe God has laid on our heart to, to knit our hearts together and uh, uh, just do what we can to support this ministry. And so we're going to believe for great things. Amen? Thanks, guys. Give them a hand. Amen? I want to spend a few minutes this morning really just talking about, I, I titled my message, The Gift not a gift, the gift. And I asked a question in the first service, how many in this room can remember a gift that you have received that when you got it, man, you cherished it, you appreciated it, you were so happy that you got it. But then there was a time after a period of time where it just become second nature, so to speak, Maybe in the corner, gathering dust. You know, I remember when the kids were younger during Christmas, how they would get underneath the Christmas tree and start opening presents. And man, rappers would fly. Ah, they'd get so excited when they see their gift. But it didn't take them long to throw that aside and grab another gift. My wife even said one time, maybe we ought to just get a bunch of empty boxes and wrap them. They have so much fun unwrapping them. Amen. But there's so many gifts that God has given us, and, and God has laid on my heart something to really ponder on and think about. And I'm going to talk about the gifts, but I want, to, I want to spend a few minutes also talking about how we sometimes, without even realizing it, we devalue the gift. Now, I, I wrote this word devalue down, and at first I thought it was just one of my words, because I do have some words I just make up, amen? Uh, but devalue, to reduce or underestimate God's worth or importance. There's so many things sometimes I think if we're not careful, we devalue. So you might be here today, you might be married, maybe you've been married for a period of time, where you really appreciated what your wife done, or appreciated what your husband done, but all of a sudden you just got familiar, and you quit saying thank you, or perhaps you quit bringing flowers. Guys, can I, can I give you a little heads up, guys? Ladies love gifts. You know, I, I will tell you, I, I, I often bring my wife flowers because I value her, and she does a lot for me. We value each other. And because of that, we've been married for 37 years. And so I'm telling you this because I want to talk about the value of the gifts that God's given us, but I'm also going to give you a heads up, a warning, how we sometimes devalue the gift and what that looks like. 
But I want to talk about the gifts for a second. There's so many gifts throughout the Scripture. You know, we talk about the free gift of salvation, which we read in Romans, and I'm going to jump through some of these quickly. But it says, because of one man's trespasses, in other words, his sin, death reigned through that one man, but much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift, the free gift, the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. See, he gives us that as a gift. He says, as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life. Again, the gift is Christ, through Christ. Ephesians talks about, for by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God. Then he goes on to say, not a result of works. In other words, don't boast about what you've done so that no one may boast For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And then I just caught the very next verse, just the first part of that verse, and I stopped. Verse 11 says, therefore, remember that. Remember that. There's so many times we look in the Scripture when he points out some things to us, and he says, remember this. Don't forget about this. You see, for me, I think about, and I've said this many times with people, how God has given us the church as a gift. And see, the gifts that God has given us, he knew that we were going to need. But see, there's times when I run across people and I say, hey, I'd like to invite you to church. Oh, I'm a believer, but, you know, I just ain't got time for church. I'm not saying that you're not going to heaven if you don't go to church. And that would be religious. I'm not about that. I'm about relationship. But see, here's what bothers me. It's when somebody says they don't need that, my thoughts go to the fact if God gave us a gift, can you imagine facing God one day and saying, thanks, but no thanks? When he knew that we needed that gift See, I know for myself, the older I get, the smarter my daddy gets. Come on, somebody. I realize there are things that God, come on, he knows before we do. Does that make him smarter than us? Absolutely. And so, with these gifts that he gives us, we should value these gifts. We should cherish these gifts. We should hold them so precious. I remember one time I was preaching, and back in that day, I, I, different, I had props, and I would use different things, and I'm not saying props are bad. I just, I probably did more back then than I do now. But I was teaching on a Christmas time and talking about the greatest gift of all is Christ. And then I went to that scripture where it says, we need to press forward to the goal of the mighty, of the, uh, press forward to the goal, which is Christ. And I said this, I said, Many of us treat Christ like a football game. I said, we get to the point sometime, we're at fourth down. It's goal to goal. We have less than a yard to go. And instead of going for it, we punt. And I took this little baby Jesus dial that I had up front, and I kicked it. And it flew in the air and the, 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 the thing that was wrapped in came off. I mean, it was one of these sights, you know. And it landed on the floor, and a young man came and picked it up and dusted it off and held it, you know, which I thought I shouldn't have done that. But afterwards, I gave an invitation, and we had a bunch of people come to Christ that day. The following week, I kicked everything inside, every man, Amen. But see, we need to cherish the gift. These are all gifts that God gives us. Here's some more. I want you to just kind of, because he says, remember this. See, all gifts come from God. Ephesians 1 says this. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, which is God. Goes over to another place. It says, these gifts for the worth, 
For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Listen, without these gifts, we can't do anything. Amen? We learn about the resurrection of Christ, and because of the resurrection of Christ, we have salvation. And again, even in the Old Testament, we come from King Solomon who wrote, which we know is one of the wisest kings, because the Bible says so. But he says in one place in 313, he says, and also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. Then it says, it is the gift of God. See, that's even a gift. Another place he says is for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth and given him power to eat of it, to receive his heritage and rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God. See, Sometimes we get a little arrogant, a little cocky, and we think we're really smart when we do something and we get wealth off of it, we gain something from it. But the Bible says even that God gave us as a gift. See, I, I, I don't pretend to be some rocket scientist. I don't pretend to have all the wisdom about investments and stuff, but every time God does something for me, I look at it and I have to say to myself, I could have never done that on my own. I know where it comes from. See, when we recognize these things, we show an appreciation of who gave them to us. But sometimes we get cocky and arrogant and we forget. He even says one place, Peter tells us that we need to minister our gifts. In other words, share our gifts. See, there are people in this room that have gifts that you would, it would blow your mind. There's some talent in this room. There's some people in this room that have some of the greatest gifts of all. He says here, Peter says, and above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sin. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. He says, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. See, as we have these gifts, see, gifts are not just for us to keep. I preached a message one time about re-gifting, amen? See, we minister our gifts, and there's people with gifts in this room. I I, I mentioned Pete, because Pete has a gift. He's been a contractor for a long time. You know what? I know because I contracted the building of this place, and I will tell you, there's not a contract in this parish should be worried about their job. Amen? That's tough. That's a tough job. But you know what? He's got a gift to do it. That's why he does it. There are people in this room that have gifts that God wants you to utilize. Not everybody can have a house where they invite people they don't even know. They pick them up at the courtroom or the courthouse or off the street and bring them and put them in their house. There's not many people who could do stuff like that. That's a gift. See, there's so many gifts in this room that God wants us to utilize and to minister from. Another place he talks about, Romans talks about this because he says the gift that we have with eternal life is a gift because we deserve to die. Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ. Then he talks about serving God with spiritual gifts. It says, I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone whom is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. Then he goes on to say in verse 6, having the gifts differed according to the grace that was given to us. Let us use them. Let us use them. We jump down a little further. He talks about one place in Hebrews, it says, don't neglect this gift of salvation. It says, therefore, we must give the more. In other words, pay really attention to this, what he's saying. To the things we have heard, least we drift away. Least we fall away. We begin to devalue the gift. See, when we come together and we stir ourselves up, we're reminded of what God done for us. And when people come in this room and they see that, hopefully they want what you got. Come on. Because see, when he talks about no one's seen God, but guess what? God is in us. And we should be 
Jesus with skin on. Come on. We should be that example of what God done for us as we utilize the gifts and, and start see people see the gifts. But sometimes if we don't, they begin to get rusty. And we drift away. St. Corinthians says, thank God for the gift. They're too wonderful to put words to. Matthew says this, you're, light on, you're the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. See, our gifts are not to be put in the closet. And here's the other thing about gifts. you got to know this. And I, and I say this with respect, and please don't take it disrespectfully, but as a kid, I remember we used to say, when somebody would give you something, they would take it back, and we would call them Indian givers. Just a term. If you're an Indian, we're not talking about you. Amen? But you know what? These are just terms, because the thing I want you to see is God is, the Bible says, he don't take back his gifts. He says in one place, he says in Romans eleven twenty nine, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Well, I messed up. So what? Everyone in this room has messed up. Some might be a little bit more public than others. But at some level, all of us have messed up. Because you mess up, you mean that God's going to come and take back the gift? No, God don't take back the gift. I like what it says here in one place in the message. It says God's gift and God's call are under full warranty. I like that. Never canceled. Never rescinded. See, God don't take back the precious gift he's given you. See, even, even to the point where I believe, I'm going to really date myself on this one, but Elvis Presley had a gift. You know, he was raised in church. Elvis Presley had an anointing on his voice. Guess what? His gift wasn't revoked. He just utilized it in the wrong way. Come on. See, God has given all of us a gift to give him glory. See, if we begin to take the glory for ourselves, we become self-centered, then we're misusing the gift that God has given us. There are so many people in this room that have some amazing gifts that the enemy has lied to you and told you how worthless, devalue. See, when we devalue our own gifts, we're not doing any justice to God because God gave us these gifts. Now, when I said that God never takes back a gift, I was reminded of a story, and it's, it's a true story because I was there, and I won't use any names, but years ago I worked with this family, and the daughter at that time couldn't have any kids. And this is really, really, it was something that really hit home with me because I had one of my sons at the same time she had adopted a little girl. And several years went by and we had picnics together through the company and constantly seen each other with our families. And all of a sudden, and to this day I don't know what all happened, but something happened where the paperwork wasn't done right and they took her precious gift baby away. And I remember, I, I cried as much as she did, because I had a son at the same age. And I, and I couldn't imagine losing such a precious gift that God gave me. Because see, the Bible says kids are a gift. I said that because, you know what? God will not do that. God is not going to irrevoke. Listen, God wants you to know today if you've had a gift stored away that you thought was useless, or you thought that you're not unworthy enough to utilize it, 
Let me tell you this, that's a lie from the pits of hell. God wants it. And the more you utilize it, the more other people will see it and grow from it. Because a man's gift makes room for himself, Rome, uh, uh, Proverbs 18, 16. And it brings him before great men. Now, just for a moment, let's look at the scripture here because I can't do this for you. You've got to do it for yourself. But you know we have to examine our lives and examine ourselves because when we examine our own selves, then we can be honest with ourselves. See, I'm not here to examine you. I'm not, there are people that sometimes think I know something about them that I don't know. I remember one time this lady came to church and she finally got her husband to come to church and I preached a message and they were fighting in the parking lot and I found out they were fighting because he thought she told him that I knew some things about him and that's what I preached about. That's what the Holy Spirit does. And so we self-examine ourselves because we talk about even in the scripture when over in Corinthians we said, examine yourself, therefore whoever eats the bread, this is before we take the communion, we talk about this, for if we take it, we need to examine ourselves, the Bible says. And one place it says here, for if we would judge ourselves, examine ourselves, we would not be judged. One place it says, let us search out and examine our ways. Then it says this, and this is the part that's so important. Let us search out and examine our ways and turn back to the Lord. See, when we recognize by examining ourselves, if we're not utilizing those gifts and we're not doing what God called us to do, when we see it for ourselves and we learn for ourselves, then we can turn back to God. See, when the son thought he knew better than the father and he took all the money and all that he had inheritance before his father ever passed, he left. And we know the story because he wasted away on worldly things. But when the father saw his son from afar off, he didn't turn his back on his son. He embraced him and said, come on in, boy. I welcome you home. You went away and you examined your life and you realized some things. And now you're home, son. Here, let's get the fatty calf. Here's the ring. Here's the rope. See, God is not one that's going to turn you away because of our own personal stupidity. Looking through the scriptures, we find David said in Psalms 26, Examine me, O Lord. And prove me. Try my mind and my heart. Try me, God. As I look through the scripture, I realize there's a lot of men and women of God that had to examine themselves as, just as we have to examine ourselves. Because when we read these stories, these stories are real men and women just like you and I. If you think they're some superheroes, if you think they're the Avengers, 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 what's that movie? Oh, I have a family full of nerds. Amen. They all... Convince me to sit three hours in that thing. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> it was over. <laughs> I, it was a good movie. All my kids, they enjoyed the grandkids, loved it. But that's just, I just wanted to spend time with them. And so, there it is. Amen. I'm not giving a commentary on it. Don't not go see it because I said so. It's good. Amen. But as we examine the, through these scriptures and we see these guys, we have to know that they had to examine themselves. Thomas said, I won't believe it unless I see it. You imagine he had to examine himself when Christ walked in the room and said, hey, Thomas, look over here. Put your finger right here in my hand. Doubt in Thomas. Moses had to examine himself looking at the back of some sheep for 40 years. Because he killed an Egyptian. He murdered a man. Don't you think he had some self-examination? Jonah had some self-examination before he stood up. He had to take a deep breath before he said, hey, the reason the ship is about to crash, I disobeyed God. Throw me overboard. Can you imagine? That was quite an examination. Some of us would rather everybody go down with us. Samson had to really examine himself when he lost his eyesight long before he could ever see. What do you mean, Pastor? Samson was called to do some great things. And he did some things wrong with his gifts. And he was captured, and he lost his eyesight. 
long before he could see to do. And he'd done greater things at the end with no eyes than he did with both eyes. Peter had to examine his heart after telling Jesus, you're not going to do that. That's not going to happen. And the whole time Jesus told him throughout the ministry, this is what's going to take place. And, and then he says, Jesus, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I, I won't ever run. And Jesus says, before the night's over, you're going to hear the crow three times. He had to really examine his heart when Jesus showed up. After he left everything and went back fishing, went back to his livelihood. And Jesus asked him three times, do you love me? Don't you think he had to examine his heart to even get it out of his mouth? <clears throat> God, you know I do. And the whole time he's thinking, I said this before and I didn't. Come on. Jesus knew that. But he examined his heart and he three times says, do you love me? And three times he says, yes, yes, Lord, you know that I do. We all have to examine ourselves. We need to examine ourselves and give God his best or our best. I was talking to my wife about this statement right here, and she said, we give God leftovers. And then she said this, and I know this to be true, because she said, you know what we do whenever we think about giving to the pantry? We reach back in our, our pantry and grab a big can of beets. Come on. Nobody likes beets, amen? If you like beets, you ain't even saved, amen? We'll be giving an altar call right after this. But we do. We, we have a tendency to give him our leftovers, give us the can that's in the back of the room that we had to sit back there. It's got rust on the top, amen? I remember one time when somebody gives a bunch of clothes, and we were going to Mexico, and we were going to give all these clothes away. And my wife said, we're going to examine those clothes before we give them away. We're not going to give them some stuff that we wouldn't even wear. Big holes and just trash. Well, you, you're giving the people. Listen, it doesn't matter. You give God your best. I remember being on a mission field one time, and a missionary received used tea bags. Now, some of you think that's crazy. I'm telling you the truth. They thought, well, you know what? We'll use them and just put them in a little thing, and we'll send them so, because, you know, they'll, be, they'll appreciate what they got. I remember one time I was doing finance, and, and when I was in, in, in a, a, a seminary, and this lady sitting across the desk from me, her and her grandfather was buying a car. And I'm the one handling the finance. And, and so she said something. She had just graduated. And I said, would you graduate? And she told me she was a bush pilot or something. And I said, oh, really? I said, are you going out to do some mission work? She said, oh, no. She says, missionaries are just low-class people. I wouldn't do that. And, I mean, she starts running down missionaries. And I'm sitting there studying to be a missionary, <laughs> holding her finance in my hand. And after she finished, her grandfather said, well, son, what do you do? Because I told him that I was in school. I said, I'm training to be a missionary. <laughs> All the color in her face fell. And my little finger hit that 18% mark, boom, amen. <laughs> She's still paying for that thing today, amen. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. <laughs> Amen. Listen. Give God your best. Don't treat him second class. Now, here's what I want to do for just a moment. We just got a few more minutes left. How do we know if we have devalued God? How can we tell in our own lives if we devalue God? The first thing is this. We devalue God's gift when we quit giving it away. What do you mean? When we quit giving the gospel away. You know that statistic tells us that when a person could save and they come to a church they really enjoy, they tell more people in the first two years than they do the rest of the time they're there. You know, we, we get to the point where we, we almost sometimes, according to the scripture, we find ourselves in a place where we almost, I don't want to say this too loud, ashamed, embarrassed. We at work and somebody don't know that we're a believer and we kind of like that. Come on. 
I remember a lady that I worked with one time, she told me that this lady in the, in the office, they were going to lunch together, and, and the lady didn't know that she was a believer. And she told me this story, and she said, and, I, and at the time I was in seminary, she told me this story. She said, one day you're going to use it when you preach, and I have, and I will. Amen? But she said, I remember inviting this lady to lunch, and before she got in my car, I saw my Bible was laying there, and I grabbed it real quick and slid it underneath my chair or my seat because I didn't want her to know that I was a believer. See, we begin to devalue God when we quit giving what God gave us. I don't know about you, but I'm proud of what God gave me. And so if you're in a place now where you're not giving away the gospel, here's what he says in Timothy. I remind you to stir up the gift of God. I remind you to stir up the gift of God is which in you through the laying of hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a peace, power, and a sound mind. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of God. At the end of that thing, he says, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I believe and persuaded that he is able to keep what he committed to, to him until this, that day. All these things. Even one place he says, if I'm ashamed, you ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. That's horrible. Then he says, follow me. And he says, for what is a man profit if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Oh, what would a man give into exchange of his soul for whoever is ashamed of me in my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, the Son of Man, will also be ashamed when he comes to his glory. Listen, that's a scary thought. See, I'm not here to judge. I'm not here to throw rocks at anybody. Look, I'm here to examine. Every time I preach, you know when I preach, I'm preaching to myself. Because long before I ever get to this pulpit, I have to do a self-examination because I know without a doubt, if I preach something that I'm not living, God's going to expose it. Look back to all the generation of people that you've seen in ministry get exposed for something. They start preaching against their own sin. See, we should not be ashamed of the gospel Here's the next thing is this. This is where we find ourselves in trouble. We devalue God's gift, losing the importance of God's gift, and begin to walk in idleness. What does that mean? We become lazy. You know, that's, that's just... One place it says here, now we command you, brethren, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who walks in idleness. And not according to the traditions that you receive from us. For you yourself know how you ought to imitate us. Because we were not idle when we were with you. See, we're quick to say, don't look at me, look at God. But see, Paul speaks and says, follow me as I follow Christ. You know, we have to see this for what it is. This is something God has given you and I. These words are not just empty words. These words are not. See, we have... Sometimes we say, well, that's for you, sister. That's for you, brother. We use our shovel and we go, oh, let's throw that back to brother so-and-so. I know he needs to hear that. God is looking for men and women to rise up. The more we rise up, the more that we do for Christ, the more that we don't sit back idly with the things God has given us, the more people can see and be saved. Even Proverbs speaks about ladies and wisdom here, and he says, she looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also will praise her. King Solomon writes again, because of laziness, the buildings decay. And through idleness of hands, the house leaks. Laziness casts one into a deep sleep and the idle person will suffer hunger. Here's the next thing. We begin to devalue God's gift when we lose fellowship with God and with one another. You know, fellowship is for us. It's important. It's important to, to fellowship with brothers and sisters. When we change the name of the church to Christian Living Fellowship, it was for a purpose. Because I want to be all about living for Christ. Fellowship. Fellowship. 
Now, what does that mean? Fellowship, fellow meaning friendship, meaning a large vessel that carries you through troubled waters. Fellowship is a friend that carries you through troubled times. Even the scripture speaks about fellowship in several different ways. It says, one place that we, it says, have seen and heard and we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Lord and with Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you, these things we tell you, these things we want you to understand, that your joy may be full. Why, is it, why do I say it like that? Because one place it says we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony through fellowship. I need you. We need each other. We have fellowship with one another in the blood of Jesus Christ. And his sin cleanses from all. And, and his son cleanses from all sin. Employing us with much urgency that we receive the gift of the fellowship of the ministry of the saints. Philippians says, for you fellowship in the gospel from this first day into now. Huh. Here's the last thing. We devalue God's gift when we stop trying after we fall into various trials. We stop trying. We give up. James says this, my brother, and count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Well, let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect, complete, lacking nothing. If you lack wisdom, ask God. He gives liberally. You know, I learned this not too long ago, that DW40, I think disbursement of water in the 40 was, that's how many times it took the guy to create it. It was 39 times where he didn't get it right, but on the 40th time he did. What an example for us. DW40. But each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires. For every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. See, there are people in this room, and I don't know everybody in this room, and the, and the more we grow, the more that we can in some ways. But you know what? I will tell you this, including myself. I know that there have been times in my life where I have devalued God, devalued the gift of God, when I fell into a trial or a situation, and you, you have a tendency sometimes to look around and go, where are you, God? And the Bible says he has never left us or forsaken us, and he's not doing it today. See, there are people in this room that quit trying. There are people, you know why it's harder to win a brother after he's known the Lord? To get him back, the Bible talks about how it's harder to win a brother like that. Because sometimes he knows how difficult it might be. Or he knows the commitment of what he needs to commit to. See, when you're sold out to God, I will promise you. First, let me say this before I say what I'm about to say. Greater is the God that's in you than he's in the world. But I promise you, when you're sold out to God, the enemy is going to do everything he can to stop you. Because, see, he don't care that you're saved and he can't do nothing about it. But the more that you fulfill the task and the gifts that God's placed in your life, the more souls you win and people see. That's what he don't like. We quit trying. Oh, God, help us. God, I never want to give up. I remember this man praying for me. Michael Gill. He knew that I had something in me, but he knew that I was so far away running from God in such a way as before I got married, before I gave God my life. But I grew up in a good home. And every day he would witness to me, and, and he was an example. He'd pray for me. One day I was up in the high lines, and there was a cherry picker putting a piece of pipe up in the high lines. I was like four stories high. And as I'm walking on this beam, I grabbed the pipe, 
and it slipped. And when it did, I fell backwards. And when I did, I fell short ways. And there was another piece of pipe. The only piece of pipe there caught my legs. And I hung upside down, looking at the concrete four stories high with some pumps underneath me that I know if I'd have fell, I'd have died. And Mike somehow, because I was in shock, boy, get up. And I got up, and he was older, and I got up, and I got to the side. And when I got to the, to the safety, I was shaking. But that's not the end of the story. What's really interesting was years later, after my wife and I graduated seminary, we were preparing to leave to go to Russia. We're in a store in Baton Rouge. And in that store, I saw Mike, and I hadn't seen this guy in years. And I recognized him and said, hey, Mike, how's it going? And we ain't seen him by long. We're talking. And he said, I said, man, you're not going to believe what God has done for us. My wife and I, we have three children now, and we're leaving to go to Russia. We just finished seminary, and, and I'm telling him what God is doing in our life. And his wife walked up, and I said, my name is Bobby Ganaway. And, and, and she immediately looked at me with a big old grin. She said, I know exactly who you are. She said, me and Mike used to pray every morning for you. Every morning. And one day, Mike came home and said, man, that boy is hopeless. I mean, I would sometimes go straight from the club to work. He would say, man, that boy is hopeless. I'm just tired of praying. I'm, I'm, I'm ready to give up on that boy. And his wife said, let's not give up on him. Let's keep praying. And that day that prayed for me was the day that I almost fell and lost my life. See, there's somebody today that you need to remember, don't stop trying. Because see, sometimes when we can't do it for ourselves, we can help others do it for themselves. But never give up. Never stop trying. Never allow the enemy to lie to you. Because when he lies to you, you begin to devalue all those gifts. Well, this morning I refuse to devalue God's gift. And I'm going to believe before we leave this place that are people in this room in a moment, we're going to close our eyes and pray. Just, this is a sacred moment. Just bear with me a second. Please hang on. I know the time has slipped away, but this is important. Let's give God the reverence. Let's close our eyes right now. Bow our heads. Close our eyes. Let's examine our lives for just a second. I'm not going to take long to do this, but if you're here this morning, you might find yourself in a place where you felt like some of the things I've said today really ministered to you in a way where you might even simply say, you know what, I see some of those things and I see them in my own life. I don't need to know what they are. This is between you and God. I want to come in agreement with you and pray. I'm not going to embarrass you, not going to call you out. just want to pray for you. But if you're here this morning, something in this message spoke to your heart. I want to pray for you. Heads bowed, eyes closed. That's you. Just You can put up your hand, and you can put it up and put it down. You don't have to keep it up. Just up and down. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Let's get honest before the Lord. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. Father, I thank you right now. As we examine our hearts, we do it because when we judge ourselves, we don't need anybody else to do so. God, as we look deep down in our hearts and we see some things that perhaps we have belittled or devalued your gifts. God, I pray right now that you begin to stir as we remind each other of what you've already done for us. God, you're an amazing God. You're a great God. So God, I pray right now that you would stir up the gifts in this room. Stir up their lives in such a way that they'll begin to walk out what you call them to do for such a day as this. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Maybe you came this morning. Maybe you realize today that you're lost in need of a Savior. Maybe you realize today that your life is not going the way that it should go and you've maybe backslidden, got away from the things of God. I promise you this morning, God is calling you home. Right there, where you're at, do that examination. And if you don't know Christ, or you need to be renewed in the things of God, this morning, right where you're at, just begin to pray, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Jesus, I repent. Lord, 
become my Savior. Jesus, redeem me, save me. Jesus, I'm getting up. I'm ready to try again. Jesus, help me, Lord. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Maybe you prayed that this morning for the first time, a rededication. I just want to come in agreement and pray for you. If you prayed that prayer, right where you at, just raise your hand. You can put it up, put it down. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. See those hands. Thank you, Lord. Father, I thank you again for your salvation. I thank you, Lord, for your love and your mercy and your kindness. And God, this morning, I pray that every hand that was raised, you'll get them plugged into good fellowship. God, they'll begin to grow, begin to flourish, begin to fulfill the gifts and callings that are inside of them that never have been denied. Blessings be upon them, we pray. We pray these things in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen and amen. If you received this word, let's give God a hand this morning. Amen.